Okay, so my childhood dream started with when I saw something very similar to this. This is what Chicago looked like. Uh, just had tracks and trains everywhere. So if anybody thinks I have too much track on my layout, remember this picture. I'd also like to point out right here is a barge. They used There was a car float operation in Chicago where they loaded cars onto the barges and there were a couple other float yards on the north side. My current layout, let's see if I can get the whole thing in here. This is backwards to me, but okay. So I have the BRC over here, BRC, and then uh, this is where the Illinois Northern starts. Hey, those Rich, there. Yeah. for those of us not familiar with Chicago, if you use an acronym, if you can just define it, that would be great. BRC oh, is Belt Railway of Chicago, right? right. And Illinois Northern is commonly known as the IN. And uh, then Chicago Junction, which later became Chicago River in Indiana, is, is the rest of this. I'll show you the layout. And the colors here all mean something. I'll get to that with the operations part. So we'll start with the belt. So I have a yard here for the belt. These are This is a temporary section, by the way, because I'm going to add on to the layout. So these tracks back here are taking the place of future industries. What's gonna be over here is the glass plant, but right now it's just the yard. So it's just a place for all the cars that would normally be carted for over here to go. And I have a little lift out bridge. And this is Elsden Yard where the Illinois Northern started. It was truly a grand trunk yard. Um, but that's where Illinois Northern started. They had a, a uh, track that ran through the Corwith Yard that Santa Fe called the IN track. And that was just their, their through track. They were always a subsidiary of uh, the Santa Fe. And here we have the Elsden Industrial District. I just put this in just to give the uh, Elsden yard operators some extra work to do. And then the next stop is the 33rd Street Yard. It's a small yard and it just services two switch jobs that come in here. The paper mill job, there's the paper mill, and there's a brewery job. So all this switching, if there's enough traffic, it can be two people. Uh, lately it's been one person can handle it. So there's the brewery. And then I have a Y here where we branch off over there to the rest of the Illinois Northern. That's 26th Street Yard in the back. And then go through the Y here and you have uh, the Chicago Junction Freight House. The real Chicago Junction Freight House had 25 tracks. I got four. Good enough. Selective compression. This is the Roby Street Yard. Roby Street was renamed Damon Avenue for anybody that knows Chicago. And Roby Street Yard is where they had their car, first car float operation. So what I do is I load cars onto here, put them in this little box and carry it over to the float yard, which I'll show you probably the last part of the layout. And this is the Ashland Avenue yard. That's all my interchange tracks. And then here is the departure yard. Turns out I have 26 tracks in Ashland Avenue yard. And the current Ashland Avenue yard that still exists has 26 tracks. That was totally by accident, not design. Uh, they have a few industries back there. There's a job that runs this. There's a little yard over here. This is the, uh, oh God, I always keep forgetting the name of this one, the Luma Street Yard. There's actually four tracks in the real Luma Street Yard right now. And it, its sole purpose is really to service this plant, which is the uh, Vantage Chemical Plant. And I have a picture of the real Vantage Chemical Plant. So I tried to capture that. Hey, Rich. And all this. Yeah. Quick request. Can you try, if you're on a phone, can you try turning your phone sideways? Sure. I don't know if everybody can see it right now. There way, we go. That's better. Does that work? Yep. Okay. Okay. And then I start in with the uh, 
what was just north of Ashland Avenue Yard was the Chicago Central Manufacturing District. It was the first, uh, what do they call it, industrial park in the country. It was built as that. Everybody got a building and a siding at a particular time that trains would come to pick up your loads. So I just have some various uh, industries back in here. This is a switch job by itself. They had their own power plant. So I've got a power plant here. And yes, those are BBs in the car, not clinkers. And then the last part here of the main layout is the International Harvester Plant, which really didn't come off the Chicago Junction. It was really on the Illinois Northern. It was pretty much the sole reason for Illinois Northern to exist, but it just didn't work out on my layout. I had it over there before and it just didn't work. It was just uh, too many people trying to crowd into the same place. So I told you about the float yard. Here's where the car floats go to. I load up the, the cars come in off the car float here and I didn't put the buildings in, but it's just a, another switching puzzle. So this is another job right here. So about those colors, let me get a car card here and I'll show you. The car cards have the colors to make everything to sort it easy. So you know by the color, if it's blue, you know it's going, it's going to land up in this area somewhere. And you just go to the next place that has nothing marked. So you have, so like this car would be, is destined right now for form 19 scrap. And I have track numbers. So even if somebody's colorblind, they can actually still operate my layout because I have track numbers listed on the layout itself. Um, this is all done at random, except for every other uh, line is an interchange yard someplace. And the way, instead of having staging, what I did with my yards is all these tracks represent other railroads. So you, as this operator gets a train in and has to uh, break it up to other railroads, he just sorts them out onto these tracks. And then when it's time for him, when he's got nothing else to do, it's time for him to pull the track with the most cars. So in this case, it would actually be this track right here that he would, would be the next one to be pulled. And then you look at what's the next spot on those cards. And then, they, then you know how to sort the train for outbound and where they will drop stuff off and make their run. So that's- Hey, uh, Rich, we got a, got a question here. Uh, Frank okay. from New York, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is my friend Andy's trying to get on and I notice there's 100 participants. Is there a limit? Yes, 100 participants is it. Okay, yeah, he got in a little late. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll let them know by text. Then. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead, Rich. I didn't hear him. What was the question? Oh, it's uh, we have a hundred participant maximum, and we hit our hundred participants tonight. So, go us. But uh, <laughs> go ahead. Huh. Okay. Well, that's kind of my operating scheme. I have uh, what I do from. Uh, Belt Railway of Chicago. They have I've given them trackage rights over the Illinois Northern to get all the way over there to Ashland Avenue Yard, and then they bring a cutback with them. Otherwise, they just interchange with Elsden, the Elsden operator, and then he's got cars for them to come back. So that kind of limits the traffic because it's all single track, and with everybody out here switching, it's sometimes rough to get through. You got to negotiate with along the way. Hey, can I come through? So that's pretty much the, the whole deal. I don't know if you have any more questions. I, I just made it so, to be simple and a lot of switching. So how many with your trains, uh, why don't you go through a typical operating session with us? Just, just go through what you'd run and, and so on. Yeah. Well, I either do it, if I have enough people, if I have at least seven people, we'll try to use real-time clock. Uh, if it's uh, less than that, we'll take turn, we'll use uh, kind of a turn base. So here I have the different areas and what was the last 
turn, if you will, or hour that was operated for that area. So you see right now, the paper job and brewery job are down at five. So that really needs to be operated before anything else. Okay, so you're running a sequence. Um, yeah. Okay. All and right. it, it tends to work out because it's all random. Okay, uh, Kent from uh, Canada had a question. Let me find him and unmute him. Kent, go ahead. Yep. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, question I had, I think you just answered, was that it's all uh, 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 basically yard limits for this entire operation? Yes, in entirely yard limits. There's no road trains, there are only yard transfers. Okay. Uh, and everything else is a switch job, whether it be in a yard. There are uh, <clears throat> nine yards on the layout and 118 industry spots. Cool. So it, it keeps keeps a lot of people busy. <laughs> I, I had 13 people here two years ago, and everybody was busy. <laughs> Thank you that was much. really fun. That was a lot of fun because it, it, everything just clicked along. You know, if you get enough people, it just moves, and you're you're busy. In fact, it usually goes silent in here because <laughs> everybody's brain is smoking while they're trying to figure out what they're doing. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, that is an N-gauge rail route, correct, correct, Rich? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it fits in a two-car garage. Got and there will be an extension here. So, that, you know, I'm going to add a steel mill and uh, and a sand quarry and another yard. Of course, got to have another yard. Yeah. I like yards. Oh, I do, too. I do, too. Put me in All a right. yard, I'm happy. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll open it up to the group. Any or does anybody have any questions for Rich? Just uh, go ahead and raise your hand or put it into the uh, the chat. Uh, there's a question of how do the operators? Oop, hold on. Uh, how do the operators uh, identify the individual rolling stock since they're end gauge? Oh. Sure. Let's go back to a car card here. I have a picture of the car. Come on. Okay. So there's a picture of the car on there and also the reporting marks. If you can read that. So you are actually reading the car number off the car then? You don't have to. I mean, if it looks like that car, as far as I'm concerned, that's close enough because chances are it is the car. If it's Got in it. the area where you're switching, it's probably it. All right. They do have uh, an orphanage, but you know it's okay. Uh, next question: How many operators in a session? Did you say seven? At least. Okay, at least seven. I, I mean, I can do it by myself, but I mean, it's really starts to move along with at least seven. I've had as many as thirteen. Got it. Um, how does uncoupling go when switching in tight quarters with end scale from David Baird in San Jose? It really is no different. You have to learn a lighter touch. Uh, but coming from HO myself, it really, it's the same thing. In fact, the first part of the layout here, uh, this section over here, that was a test layout because I wasn't sure end scale was going to work. Because I remember N scale from when I was a kid, and it was junk. Got it. And and my wife was kind of supportive of the idea. She says, "Oh, do the little ones." I go, "You mean N scale?" Okay. So I tried it. Bought like 25 cars and an engine, and if I could do switching, I'd be happy, and I could. So All right. it was really no different than HO. Got it. Uh, let's see. Next question: um, How high is your bench work? 48 inches. 48 inches, and it's all one level, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I think we talked about your cards. Uh, you don't really have to restage between sessions, do you? No, I never okay. do. All right. Because every move restages the next move. Got it. Uh, somebody ask, asking what type of camera or phone are you using because it looks really clear. <laughs> Uh, it's a S10, Galaxy okay, S10. Galaxy S10. 
Um, let's see, da, 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 da. just running through the questions here. Uh, somebody, uh, Frolin from, uh, is asking, how do you qualify a new operator skill level phone query trick questions to determine if a guest can handle a job alone or do they need some helper with them? Usually I can just ask them, they know what they, you know, what do you like to do? Okay. I can kind of match you up to something. Okay. Uh, you're doing di you've got Digitrax, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Wired, wireless? Both. I have okay. uh, I have both uh, simplex and duplex radio capability as okay. well as the, uh, you know, the Bluetooth to the phone. So okay. multiple ways to get into the railroad. <laughs> got it. Um, let's see. I'm just making sure we got all the questions. Uh, Cliff Linton asked, could we get an image of the routing slip? And I think that's what we're looking at right now. Yeah, that's uh, a so card. So we're good there. Um, Maybe you want to see the layout. Yeah, um, let's – so go ahead and flip your camera sideways again. That'll be better. Oop. So you can see colors where yeah, stuff on the card card says it should go. Um, your layout is in a garage. It correct? really makes when you're sorting like at Ashland, you're sorting by color for the outbound trains. Okay. You said your layout's in a garage. If so, what do you What's do for that? heat and ventilation? Is one of the questions. Uh, Rich? Dang, I think we lost him. <laughs> Rich, I think we lost you. I'm back. Okay. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you all right. So, um, okay. and so you're, you're basically, your car card and your way bill are basically combined on that one form. Somebody's asking. Um, anything special right. about your lift like bridge? 20. A, uh, go ahead. No. It's really very simple. Uh, it just picks up and I got it already wired so I don't have to hook up any uh, electrical connections. Got it, so it's a lift out. It fits so. in snug and then I use a, yeah. All right, and somebody's yeah, question, here, I'll show you the, I think we covered the, this already. It's Mostly interchange between railroads on the, uh, you know, all the different railroads represented. Um, you're just moving cars essentially from one railroad to the next, right? Yes, and also, to, well, to the industry. It's either it's coming from a railroad that's, you know, off the layout to an industry somewhere on the layout. And then the next move, it's going to another place off the layout. So it'll go to the railroad. Okay. Um, Jack's asking how many cars approximately on your layout? Somewhere around 700. Okay. All right. All right. Um, if there aren't any other, if there are any other questions, we've got another, but another, three or four minutes. Um, if you have other questions, open up the chat window. Uh, Kent is asking, how do the car cards get refreshed? Um, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you mean, um, I'm gonna unlock you, Kent, so you can clarify your question. I don't think he really refreshes them, but Kent, you're, un mm -hmm. Oops. Kent, you're unmuted. Can you ask your question? Sure, uh, I noticed that you tr uh, you're putting down on the car card how they get the cars get uh, processed in each session. Um, do they do you like reprint these cars when you get to the end of it, or is it just that you have a fixed list and you just go from the top to the bottom, or what? Functionally, I have reprinted, uh, but I've never completely gone through an entire car card before I end up changing something on the layout and I got to reprint all the car cards. <laughs> so 
I haven't hit, but I, my plan was to just print just the uh, color portion of the car card over again and paste a, a thin sheet of paper over this. So that's how I would refresh it. I did, did it in a couple cases where I changed some of the trackage and okay, for these cars, I have to put something new and I just paste it over it. Right. But with 20 spots, it takes quite a while. You're moving 700 cars, 20 spots. It's going to be a long time before those are all filled up. I figure it's going to be, I just retired the cards that I had here two years ago and uh, they were only about half full. So it'll probably take me four years to fill up the cards completely. All right. Um, let's see, another question, Bearheart. What's your biggest challenge operating an end scale? Keeping the engines running. They collect lint. They like to collect lint. Uh, let me show you one here between the wheels and the side frame. And, and the first time I cleaned one of these, I had an engine that was running really well and all of a sudden it started running absolutely horrible. And so I took the truck apart and I said, well, what's this gasket here? Why do they have a gasket on a wheel? It looked like a fiber gasket. And it was just the uh, lint it was all wrapped around the, the end of the axle. So, so now I know to look for that. Somebody's asking, how will you proceed with scenery? Uh, as soon as I finish the rest of the building, I'll start with scenery. Got I've it. got some scenery down, you know, but not much. Yeah. All right. And last, we'll take this as the last question. Uh, for the lint, do you have a dryer in the garage? No, that's just okay. normal dust. Just you know, dust and crud. So, yeah. All right. Well, Rich, thank you so much for presenting your railroad. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, in the email that went out, I sent out a link to some more about Rich's layout. Um, he's got his pictures up on operatingsessions.com, which is a site I run. So, Rich, thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right. Um, thank you. All right. Uh, next on the docket is, um, let me find him. Uh, Mark Dance uh, from Vancouver, BC. Uh, Rich is from Chicago. If he didn't, I don't think he said that. Uh, Mark, I see you're connected with two different ones. I'm going to unmute the one with the camera. Are you ready to present? I am. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Uh, turn this off so we get two images. There we go. Well, welcome. Thank you, Eric. You tell me if you guys are quite cut out for any reason. Uh, welcome, brethren and sister, as you said. Sorry about my hair. I've been haven't been able to get to a barber in a while. I'm not sure anyone else is suffering through the same thing. So my layout is called the Columbian Western, and it's more similar than different to Rich's layout. It's end scale and it's in a two car garage, and it uses a lot of color. Uh, I see actually a lot of people that have operated on the layout are actually part of this call tonight. So hopefully, if that's a positive experience, we'll find out. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the operational aids that we use on the layout because uh, Eric wanted me to stay away from talking a lot about the actual layout and doing a walk around because you can see that on the YouTube channel. Yeah, so just uh, hold on just a second, Mark. In the email that went out today, there is a link to Mark Dance's YouTube channel. Please check it out. He's got some great videos. Um, we tried, we did a test tour, but unfortunately, the well, let's just say the video that he took is far better than what we did over a phone. So make sure you avail yourself of that. So go ahead, go ahead, Mark. So I mean, in the future, if anybody wants to, to do a walkthrough, we can do that instead. But right now, let's cover the operating aids. And I want to talk about, we use timetable and train order because that's what the prototype used, prototype on model. But we do it without agents. So many people do that. We have a slight variation on that. So we'll talk about an agentless timetable and train order. But right now we're in the crew lounge, which is also the, the guest suite, which is a 10, 100 square foot addition to the two car garage. The layout itself, we're gonna go see that. It's about 350 square feet. Uh, it's multi-deck end scale, use a lot of color. The reason why we're starting here is because this uh, old laptop is actually the dispatcher control panel. It's running GMRI Panel Pro. 
and the uh, dispatcher can use it to actually set the train order signals. Can you, um, whoever's doing the camera, can you uh, zoom in on that dispatch panel so we can take a look? Sorry, I didn't Hi. introduce this to my son Isaac. Hi there. Isaac's helping us out. Um, I can't actually zoom in right now. I don't know why, but uh, yeah. Well, just, just take the camera closer so we can see the panel. That's all. Your mom's iPhone, which using my Galaxy. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, act like the dispatcher and throw a, tra a train order signal here, semaphore, and we'll All see right. why that when we go into the room. So I just threw the westbound train order semaphore, meaning there's orders at Corkendall. We'll go there and have a look at that in a few minutes. So we're now going to leave the train, the crew lounge, make our way into the layout room. Before we do, this is the crew board, call board. Pretty common, pretty standard. Uh, the only thing that's a little bit different about it is we actually assign uh, ski run analogies in terms of how difficult the jobs are. There's really no difficult jobs on this layout, but for people that are nervous, including myself, when I go operating on someone's layout, I like to know what I'm getting into. So for very easy jobs, we assign a green dot. More challenging jobs are blue squares, and then finally there's the black diamonds for the people who really want to be challenged. There's a few of those. Anyway, that's one thing that may be a little bit different. So now we're now walking into the, the layout room itself. Um, we're walking through a couple of swing gates. The top one remains closed during operations. The bottom one can be opened and closed. So I'll have a look at the layout itself just quickly. Is the sound still all right? Yeah, you still sound yeah. great, Mark. You're good. So uh, what we have on the lower deck is at 42 inches, we have most of the switching operations. So the main yard is in the background, uh, some water level running, through to the Castlegar, which is a pump mill. Uh, and then on the upper deck, we have actually a climb across the monasteries. Starts around 52 inches, goes up to 64 inches, and then back down again. So uh, the prototype is actually the Canadian Pacific Southern Main Line across British Columbia, specifically the boundary subdivision. And when I first started designing the layout, I really just wanted to build an end scale layout that was Canadian. That's about as far as I went. Then I started getting more and more enamored about the boundary subdivision. I wanted to build it as close as I could to the boundary. And then I realized when I had to start making more compromises, and in fact, maybe doing everything exactly the way the prototype did wasn't really my objective. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Because my objective actually isn't to build a super accurate model railroad, it's actually to build a railroad that people have fun with. Um, so we also have inside this area here, which is a double mushroom, we have a lower deck and an upper deck. This is the isolated slow can and caslo subdivisions, and we're not going to cover those today. Uh, what we see here is a train. This is train number 81. We'll cover that in a bit. And that uh, is climbing the hill to, to Farron Summit. This is the main subdivision, division point yard in Nelson, BC. Um, this is really the bottleneck of most layouts, and that's also the bottleneck of our layout here. I try and have uh, operating sessions that can run between seven or eight visitors. Most of the jobs run the full three or four hours of the session, including the two jobs that switch Nelson. Uh, the fast clock rate is five to one, and whereas the prototype ran about two trains across this hill per day, we run about 10. So there's a lot more, and about two thirds of those actually go through the yard. So there's a lot of more traffic. So I do a lot of things actually to try and make it easier for the yard to operate and get so it doesn't slow down the rest of the, the layout. I talked a little bit about what my objectives were. When I started becoming constrained by the space, although the aisles are three foot in, in width at, at the minimum, we have getting more than eight or nine people in this room, you start getting congested and you certainly get the heat load up. So I wanted to try and make sure that everybody that was here was having a good time. And when I started looking at how the car forwarding was gonna work, I became concerned that just like the prototype, I was gonna end up with a lot of non-throttle carrying jobs, a lot of people moving paper around like clerks. So I had to come up with some ideas to try and make, make sure that the people that were here were getting the most fun. So that's really my objective behind the layout is actually try and make sure that everyone has a really good time and that it actually works. It's challenging, but not challenging because it's difficult, challenging because you have to really use your head. So that's what, what I see as an objective of this layout anyways, is not to replicate the prototype exactly, but to provide a challenge that people enjoy and want to come back to. So some of the things that we do, the division point yard of, of Nelson actually to the east, which is to the left always when you're operating a layout, um, that subdivision is a Nelson subdivision that runs from Cranbrook to Nelson. I operate that as a host crew. I operate it as if it was under uh, yard limits. So as the 
workload in the yard ebbs and flows. I can actually bring trains in or take them away to make sure that the yard doesn't become overloaded. You may also notice there's a lot of colored tags on the tops of the cars. Scott Sabo, I noticed, was on, on the call. Got the idea from Scott. Um, most of the cars are actually 40 foot long CP boxcar red boxcars. And the yard tracks are actually on 13 foot centers. So it's not very easy to see the, the numbers, even if they were different, differently numbered, which they're not. So we use tags to actually figure out exactly which trains the cars have to go into. The colors make that really easy. Similar to the way Rich had colors, uh, we use colors to figure out exactly which cars, the, the trains, cars go into which trains, make it easy for the yard to, to keep up with the load. So those are a couple of things that we do. Now the, the car tags themselves are really like, like way bills. The demand for those tags comes from a spreadsheet and each operating session, I rerun the spreadsheet and figure out what loads and which empties each industry needs or each industry needs. And then the tags are actually assigned either to cars that are available or they're assigned to cars in staging. And that causes a continual refreshing of the number of cars and the types of cars that are on the layout. So what other things do we do? Well, some of the job aids we have, this is the car routing. This is, um, I don't know, hopefully you can see that okay. This is car routing sheet showing which color the tags go in which direction. Uh, so the grays are out going at the Sokan, the Kazo subdivision, that's a separate train. The oranges are the ones going across the boundary. Even the cabooses that are assigned with the conductors will have tags on them as well to make it easy, easy to figure out which, ta which cabooses go in which trains. Another job aid we have is this blocking diagram, which is generally in the order which the trains go out. Again, you can see it's by color, which makes it easy to assemble the trains. Um, we run two shifts in any given operating session we run as if there were two shifts being run from 5 a.m. until 9 p.m. And then the evening shift, which we don't run, I use between sessions to try and make sure that there's at least three trains ready to go at the beginning of the session so people aren't waiting around. In conjunction with the, the blocking diagram, this is the arrival departure sheet. This is new. This is changed for every operating session because it indicates which power is being used on which train and when it has to go out and what the number, maximum number of cars are that will be assigned uh, will be allowed on that train on that day. And it also acts as a terminal register where the, the upon time is there and the, and the conductor's initials are applied as well. So these are some of the job aids that we have. Um, we'll cover any more. Um, each train, when it goes out, has a train instruction in the order they go out. This one is actually for the craft switcher, 8727. Everything you need to know about the train is actually on the front. For anybody who wants to use a switch list and doesn't like using tags, there's a space in the bottom where people can actually transcribe the information from the tags onto the switch list. I've never seen anyone use this. I think when people are actually take a train out with the tags, they realize how simple it is and they don't actually want to go back. On the back of the train instruction sheet is a timetable, and I'll show you a larger version of that. So this is the timetable for the boundary subdivision. Of note, there are actually only four trains that are actually scheduled, and two of them don't go past Castlegar. So there's only two that actually run across the boundary sub, across the, the Monashi summit at, at Farron. Everything else is run as an extra. So only about a third of the trains are actually scheduled. And they're all class fours. So according to the UCOR, extra is run at, at the same seniority level as class fours in the same direction. So that means that extras can actually run ahead of class fours as long as they maintain a certain spacing. And we'll show you how we do that. So we've got a train here, train number 81. I think maybe so far a bit. Yep. We're just gonna run this one up to Farron so you guys can see how the agent of train order operators work. Uh, while you're running that, we've got a couple of questions for you. Um, how often do you host operating sessions? I'd love to do it once a month. If we can do it once every two months, that would be a great achievement. So about six times a year. This, this layout hasn't been operated until since September because we had a big operating session, a uh, big invitational van rail in September of last year. And I, I always get burned out and wiped out. For oh, months. yeah. Van rail is a huge one. I've and heard course, about that. The world's gone into a different place in the last few months. So we were supposed to operate twice again in the last couple of months, but that hasn't happened. Got it. Okay, go it's ahead. First been operated. This is train 81, which is one of the scheduled trains. It runs from Nelson through to Midway. On this layout, it runs to Cascade. 
and it's at a dark, it's at a train order station siding called Corkendall. And it's approaching the, the train order, and as you can see, the semaphore blade is actually down. These are nitinol powered semaphores. So we're going to simulate what would happen under our agentless train order system approaching this. So we can, we can approach and clear to the next clearance point. So I'm going to pull up to the, the road crossing here and stop. Um, while you're doing that, a couple more questions. Um, do you have a fast clock and what are you running it at? Yeah, we run it five to one. Okay. I'm using OS here. So the OSing is done using just simple 15 minute install phones in, in um, intercom mode. Got it. Um, there's a question about is van rail an invitation only or is it first come first serve? Okay, so I would phone the dispatcher and say, dispatcher, this is Corkendall. Dispatcher would say, Corkendall, proceed. Say, Corkendall, this is number 81. N number 81 is cleared at whatever time. Got it. And that's how we OS. All right. So Van Rail is invitation only. Uh, okay. anybody, invite, anybody interested can contact Scott Calvert. Uh, if you don't have your email address, you can contact me, and I'd be happy to put you in contact with Got it. Scott. All right, <laughs> so, go ahead. All right, so now we've approached. There's a signal down for us. That means there's an order. So I would go to um, the entrance of the layout and get a train order for this train. This is actually for a different train, but I'm simulating. <coughs> Excuse me. Train order telling me that I have a meet with an extra at Farron so I can proceed. Now what I have to do though, is I'm not allowed to go past that board, past the clearance board, point controlled by that board. So I actually press a protection button and as you can see the semaphore has been lifted and I can now proceed. So that GMRI um, panel for was also running some logic that keeps that board up until the caboose passes. And once the caboose pass, passes, it'll drop it down again and hold it down for 20 scale minutes, 20 fast minutes, sorry. <laughs> and that protects from my back end so that no one will over overrun me. And this is the way in which the extras and the scheduled trains in class fours can be kept separate. Got some uh, converted wood chip gondolas there, don't you? Yeah, there's CMS. <coughs> Excuse me, I got to move my throat. So in this way, the engineer is acting as part of the agent's role. They're clearing themselves, clearing the signal, and they're OSing, which is the job that the agent would normally do. I did want to use my pressure space and heat capacity in the layout for, for long throttle carrying jobs. I personally prefer running the engines, so I assume my visitors do. Uh, Mark, you're kind of uh, fuzzing out there. Your your screen has frozen. <laughs> so did, did some... I'm frozen. I'm frozen. So yeah, yeah. You probably need more Okay, let's try going back here. Yeah, go back. Can you better? Is it maybe better, Eric? Yeah, it's better. Okay. So the, the board's now been reset by the Logic and the Panel Pro. And it's uh, it's dropped behind the, the uh, train, and it'll stay there for 20 scale, 20 fast minutes to make the back end. So my orders told me to meet an extra at Farron and to take the siding. I would normally be on the main, so it must be that the, the uh, extra has some work here. Barron is actually a pusher station. <coughs> Excuse me. Just like the prototype. So the pushers are actually located here and dispatched to the foot of the hill in both directions. So I'm just pulling into Farron. I have, to, I have a break test here for 30 minutes. 
call OS the dispatcher and let them know what I'm doing. Dispatch, this is Farron. Train 81 is into Farron at 1.30 p.m. So that's the way in which the train would make its way across the, 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 uh, the layouts. OSing as it goes, and the dispatcher was able to see its progress by watching for the um, the protection buttons being pressed as it as it goes through on its dispatcher panel, and he could control and the uh, flow of trains over the layout using train orders, which they issue through, um, which he would write himself and pass into the layout through a pigeonhole board that's at the entrance. So that's the demonstration for today. Happy to take any questions if you have any. That's great. Um, I'm just running through the chat window here for, for questions. Um, let's see, what's the ratio between model and prototype length? Uh, um, the prototype is 150, 126 miles, and this layout is about uh, eight scale miles. Okay. So 20, 20 to one. All right. Um, do now, the tag I don't model, I don't model all 126 miles. I model about probably about 76 miles of it. Got it. Do the tags on the cars indicate a town or a specific industry? And how do you determine what cars require pickup? So that's a very good question. So the yellow would indicate the train it goes into, similar to the way, um, well, in this case, all these trains are going on the craft switcher, which is the yellow, the yellow train. There are the um, mnemonic on the top indicates the industry, in this case, Pilgrim Talbot, and then the spotting location of that industry, number two. The um, car forwarding scheme here shows you the cars associated with each town and each train that services those towns. When, if, you, if you get to uh, an industry and the industry has a tag that's different than the industry, then it indicates that the car needs to be moved. Either it's an off spot or it needs to be returned to its location. To return to its original site. Okay. Sent on its sent on its way. All right. Are the call boards run using Digitrax or is it LCC? You say, it sounded like JMRI, but what else do you have wired up to that? The call boards. You the mean, uh, the panel you were showing over there by the. Oh, this here. This this is a custom panel. It's using a Digitrax DS sixty four, so one per train order station. And because you have two different directions, so that you have four switches that can be thrown, four turnouts that can be thrown with the DS64. Two of them are for shunting the, the 0.3 amps for the night null to drop the semaphores, and two of them are for the LEDs. And they, these are the, um, the protection buttons are used as inputs. So in this case, I pr press the protection button, and it'll wait uh, for, one scale, for one minute, and then it'll drop the board for, for five and minutes. And it's the JMRI that's handling your timing, correct? Well, it's the logics. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, somebody's asking to see a train. Yeah, somebody's asking to see a train order example. Uh, you seem to have frozen. There you go. Is that better? So this is to the conductor and engineer of 4057, as well as the conductor and engineer of 4104, both at Cascade, setting a meet, and giving rights for them to run. So 4150, no, sorry, not a meet, 4104 East run ahead of 4057, type for Nelson. So it's, it's enabling two extras to be created at Cascade that are running East. All the eastbounds are run as extras. Got it. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, um, Kent Cavanaugh, Cavahan asked, hi, Mark. I can't remember. Are the passengers run as extras as well? Kent. Kent, we don't run passengers on this lab. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, lots of – you can see all this in the chat. Uh, very nicely done. Awesome layout. Very well designed and executed. Um, does the dispatcher write the train orders? Yes, yes, he yes. does. All right. that's, a that's a difference from the prototype, of course, because we don't have agents. Um, it makes for a busy dispatcher, but it makes for one less person that I need to employ and allows the people that do come to actually be able to do what I would want to do, which is actually run a train. I know there are a lot of people that enjoy being agents and operators. Uh, 
if we were to be prototypical, I'd probably need, you know, a dozen or more uh, people writing paperwork, switch lists and stuff. Yeah. But we try to optimize it so that the people who are here are going to be actually running, running engines. Got it. Uh, another question on the self-dispatch auto panel, how often do crews forget to use to select clearance or run past it without forgetting to push the button? A little less often than they forget to register at the train register. <laughs> uh, uh, Kent's reply, see, I told you you couldn't remember, or told you I couldn't remember about the passengers. Um, let's see, a question. What spreadsheet do you use for car forwarding? Excel. I'm happy to provide it anybody's interested. And actually, one of the videos on the YouTube channel goes through it in, in detail. There's really only one calculation line. But because of the way it's set up, I can actually change the loading on the whole layout with just setting a couple of knobs. So if I'm bringing in a, a less experienced crew and actually dial down the whole load on the layout, then I can see the impact it's going to have on the train lengths. So I can see how more, if train length is a decent indicator of complexity, then I can actually dial down or dial up the complexity of the layout. Cool. Very, very well, helpful. Well, Mark, if you can, if you can get that spreadsheet to me, I can yep. put it up on the OPSIG site and I will send it out in a update. Uh, so sure. everybody who's That'd interested. I think the YouTube video is probably the best way to actually consume that stuff. So. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, how long does restaging between us, between your sessions take? That's a great question. It takes two hours less than it used to. Uh, so it probably takes about three hours. Of that three hours, about an hour of it is, is shunting trains around between um, different endpoints. And only about an hour, an hour and a half is actually changing the tags. So that's a very little time. It takes about a half an hour longer, I estimate, than it would take if I was using car cards. Got it. All right. Um, just looking back through the chat here. Um, the commercial, the control panels are beautiful from David Baird in San Jose. Were they made commercially to your design? Oh, the, the turnout controls? Yeah, the uh, those metal panels, the, the, the train order panel there. Yeah, those ones are uh, those are custom made. All right. Uh, somebody asks, is your operating scheme captured in the YouTube videos? I think the answer to that yes. is yes. It is. Yeah. All right. Um, there's, enough, there's enough demand. I'm happy to walk through the construction of the layout in a future uh, future video. We we may take you up on that. Um, we haven't covered this, the the whole layout that's inside the mushroom yet. Do you want to take a quick walk through there, just for? No, no, too messy, too messy, too messy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, if you want to, you can raise your hand, or you can type it into the chat. Uh, how long have you been building the layout? Started in 2005, uh, so 15 years ago, nearly to the day. And it was the first operating session was held in September of 2008. Um, so it was 100% it was functional in 2008. And then since then, it's really just been scenery and structures and you know, doing things like making the train order signals and figuring out how we're going to run the thing. So I hadn't actually built a layout before. Any of any kind of size. This was the first significant one. And I'd run on very, very few layouts. So by the time I actually had a layout that was able to be run, I'd actually gained a lot more experience in operations. I had to figure out how to layer layer a time tip on train order over top of an existing layout. It was a challenge. Got it. Uh, let's see. Um, what track are you using? Pico Co. Fifty Five. Bulletproof. All right. Uh, nice explanations of some of your operations. Beautiful layout. Thanks for the short tour and presentation. Uh, is the cameraman a regular operator? I think it's your son, right? Uh, I am not. No. Okay. I, great, I greatly enjoy this layout, but uh, no, I do not know how to operate the cars that well. <laughs> Got it. Uh, somebody else has commented. Now I'm really inspired to get into the basement and work on my end scale layout. I guess tonight was engaged, Nate. It wasn't uh, planned that way, but uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely, a, you know, so one of the questions that Rich had, he had several questions about the, the couplers. Yeah. I, yep. Most of my operators are actually HO operators, HO layouts. And coupling and uncoupling an N scale is actually easier 
for our experience in an HO. Yep, I found uh, that too. From a locomotive point of view, I don't have any problems with lint. I clean the local wheels between each session. That takes about an hour. Um, my, the biggest issues I have are probably the weights of the carts because we have live helpers. And, um, you know, the train legs are about 25, 30 cars. You got three units on the front, two in the back. And I don't think you can put enough weight in the cars to prevent people from who have ham hand, ham fists from pushing the, tra the cars off the rails. Yep. But it's not a big deal. I mean, people quickly become attuned to how to operate the, the pushers and it becomes a really enjoyable experience. Yep. How many, uh, what, what's the fleet size, engines and cars approximately? Uh, probably 40 to 50 locomotives. It's, most of them are FM. Because um, that, was, that was a very interesting part of the prototype. They had a lot of H-liners and C-liners, a couple of train masters. Uh, the cars on the layout are probably about four to 500. I think we move about four or 500 per, per session. Got it. Um, question, do you body mount your couplers? No, I don't. Okay. All I, all I do is weather them. All right. Um, any more questions? Uh, do your engines have sound? At least one unit per consist has sound. And I'm looking forward to the day when I can actually have the different types of prime mover in them because you may have seen from the lash, lash ups, they were an interesting uh, amalgam of like FM, EMD, and ALCO in the same concept. So it'd be nice to have the different prime movers running. <laughs> but that's, that's something very difficult to get into every NSCO local. Yeah, a lot, lot less space there than HO or the larger ones. Yeah, I, I have just added uh, stay alives to some of the sea liners because they were big chunks of metal that just need to be milled away. And that makes a big difference. The ESU speakers are wonderful, wonderful uh, sound, but the uh, lifelike locomotives were pretty dodgy when it came to reliable pickup. So having the, the stay lives in there makes a big difference. Yeah. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, Mark, we want to thank you so much for presenting. Um, thank you for organizing it, Eric. Um, it's a gorgeous lad. I love the I love the snow scene there behind you. That's uh, I'm doing some Canadian modeling myself and. <laughs> I mean, that's just gorgeous Most, work. So, as far as snow is not a purely Canadian thing, I think you get a bit of it in the U.S. as well. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying that particular snow scene with the snow shed and all that is is gorgeous work. So, thanks so much for sharing. Thank you, thank you, Isaac. <laughs>